on the plane coming here, I was sitting next to a woman from the University of New Mexico who said, this is one of those conversations you only have when Google pays for the ticket, but she said, after the mass extinctions of mastodons, saber-toothed tigers, and giant sloths 10,000 years ago, the amount of methane in the atmosphere, she says, this is really the case, dropped by 10 billion kilograms. And when I went to the hotel here, I looked that up. That's a sizable fraction of what was in the air back then. And I, I thought, why? And she said, the animals in those days were unusually big, I'm not quite sure how to put this politely, they were usually big farters because their, their gaseous emissions uh, were so considerable that the disappearance of them and their emissions caused a statistically significant atmospheric gas collapse. Which is, I know, when you think of it, it's particularly interesting these days because methane's the bad guy in global warming. And I'm thinking, well, maybe this is the good side of the extinction story. I don't know. But I, I don't even know if it's true. But if it checks out, I find things like this really, really interesting, and, and, which is my advantage and my problem. Because what I find interesting is not always interesting to my colleagues and bosses in the news business. Yet I often think I, I found like story gold here if they would only think like me, but they don't think like me. So case in point, one time I got a videotape from a marine biologist, and when I looked at it, I thought, oh my god. I mean, it was, it was like nothing. I, you may have seen it by now. This was a while ago. And I said, oh no. I run downstairs to Peter Jennings' office. I worked at ABC News at the time. I said, I have an octopus story. He said, it was, like a, it was an octopus in shallow Caribbean waters. And I said to Peter, this is going to knock your socks off. I mean, you got, so I go to, he has this uh, tell tape, he had this tape recorder there. And I, I started to jam and he said, don't go away. I said, no, I'm not going to go away. You, you need to see the octopus story. He said, I'm going to stick in. He said, no. I said, well, why not? He said, well, it may have escaped your notice, but the U.S. Army is now occupying Baghdad, and we've conquered the place. Saddam Hussein and his two sons, Uday, the other one, have gone missing, and we are concentrating on that. I said, for the whole show? You have 18 and a half minutes. You can spare like a couple of minutes for my octopus. Let me just stick it in. Said, no, you can't stick it. Said, Come on, I want to stick it. No. He said, all right. This is, this is the situation I'm always in. I said, look, if I made my octopus story about Saddam Hussein, <laughs> would you run it then? Now he's looking at me. I am not especially proud of what you're about to see. Let's roll the tape. After Saddam and his son stole more than a billion dollars, there's talk now that he is searching for a cosmetic surgeon to disguise himself. Well, Saddam the dictator might want to meet Saddam the octopus, because <laughs> some octopuses really know how to I am so ashamed. <laughs> This is what octopuses do for a living. They disappear all the time. For example, Roger saw this bush in shallow Caribbean water. But as he moved closer, now watch the bush. Look at this. It turns into an octopus. Right? I mean... ink and runs. That's good. This one's one of the best. We got to see this again. Let's go backwards before it ran away to when the octopus was all puffed up to look big and scary. And now, backwards and in slow motion, watch the eyes. You see how the pigment is changing back to a dark algae and rock color? And the skin, if you look, it's beginning to pucker. It becomes more rock-like. This is deliberate. So if they see the algae next to them, they can mimic the algae. Yeah, it's definitely getting lumpier all over. And this is happening. The muscle changes and the color changes. How long in real time? It takes less than a second to make any of these changes. So they can become a rock in less than a second. It's instantaneous. I mean, like, yeah. look, I mean, come on, you know? So, so I, thank you. And uh, so, I, so I ask myself, well, why is this so hard? I don't blame Peter for trying to cover Saddam. Of course he should cover Saddam. But the real problem in the news business, like all mature businesses, is that they found a routine, and it's a deep routine, a way of doing business and a way of seeing the world. So I'll tell you what it's like. On a typical morning, you go to the news meeting, and they go around the room and say, okay, what do you got? And the reporters and the editors, they pitch. So I got the governor's press conference. I got the three-alarm fire. I got a, a pennant race. I got a murder. It comes to me and says, I've got the Pleistocene fart story. And, uh, you know, it may not be fair, but the room goes a little quiet, and they give me that look, you know. Uh, but, but I know, just as I knew here, I know what I'm doing, and I know it will be good. Uh, but, and at the morning meeting, at 10 o'clock in the morning, when the day is young, your special story is often the favorite, because governors come and go, but a fart collapse is very unusual. You talk about it all day. But here's what happens. Around noon, 
The governor gives a slightly interesting press conference, and you have to do it because the competitors are going to do it. There's a burglary, you got to do that. There's a fire, you got to do that. There's a tornado warning, you got to do that. And slowly but surely, you watch your precious story drop lower and lower on the sked, the list of stories they're going to do. And by about 3 or 4.30, you hear it go kerplunk, and it drops off the list. We'll do it tomorrow, they say, because after all, it happened 10,000 years ago. And you go, yeah, yeah, but then the next day, the same thing happens. So Peter once asked me, like, what do you do here anyway? And I said, well, what you do is this just in. This just happened. He just got elected. He just got shot. I do this always is. Stories that are sitting right in front of us all the time. We don't know about it. And I happen to think that this always is is just as interesting as this just in. And I'm convinced, totally convinced, that you can mix science and mystery and complexity into a new show with ease and success, and partly to prove it a bunch of years ago with an amazing partner, Ajayad Abumrad, um, who was recently, by the way, pronounced a genius by the MacArthur Foundation. We created this show called Radio Lab. It's a podcast and radio show. It's gotten really popular. Some of you, okay. And, and what we do on this show is we try, to, we try to break or at least experiment with some very basic journalism rules. So normally, if a reporter gets a story, what you do is you interview people, you learn what you're doing, you get your research down, you write your copy, you check your copy, you check your facts, and when everything's known and checked and ready, you go on the air and you say, let me tell you what I know. We don't do that. Instead of telling you what we know, we tell people what we don't know. And we do our reporting and our learning right in front of our audience. So we argue, we make mistakes, we interview people, we try to figure out what they've just said, and it creates a kind of edginess because you watch us learning. So to give you a taste of this alternate model, one time we got to wondering, where does music come from? That was our subject. We can go for a whole hour, so we can ask big questions. And one of the thoughts was that music may have evolved from speech, from people talking. So to explore the people talking produced music hypothesis, we found a woman who makes tapes of people talking and loops them. People talking and loops them. People talking and loops them. People talking. It just connects them like that. And what you're about to hear is an accident. It's an accident that taught her something, and now you are going to experience that very accident. Here we go. So you put things on loops in order to fine tune the way the speech sounds. So I had this particular phrase on a loop and forgot about it. What phrase was this? It's a phrase that occurs at the beginning of the CD in which I say, the sounds as they appear to you are not, not only, only different, different from those, those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. To seem quite impossible. Now, I had sometimes behave so strangely loop. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely, sometimes behave so strangely. Just those few words. Sometimes behave so strangely. And forgot about sometimes it. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. So here's what happened. Diana sometimes leaves her studio. She closes the door, goes into the kitchen to make sometimes some tea. All the while, this loop is whirring away in the background. As she's sipping her tea, she thinks... Sometimes is someone so singing? Strangely. Who's singing? I heard what sounded like song in the background. She realized, wait a second. That's not singing. That's me talking. That very phrase. So strangely. But at this point, sometimes behave so strangely. appeared to be sung sometimes rather than spoken. So strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. This is sometimes behave so strangely. Right? <laughs> yeah. You still hear the words, but the they're sung words rather than spoken words. It's weird. Like, it just switches at a certain point. Three or four repetitions in. Right. It's going, it's going, and then pow, it becomes music. And then now now none of us can get it out of our head. Like, the whole office is like, sometimes behave so strangely. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes behave, behave so, so strangely. strangely. And you know what? If you do this demo and then you go back to the original sentence, it sounds like, you know, speech to begin with. And when you come to that very phrase, I seem to be bursting into song. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. I have to say this can continue for months and months. It's sort of, <laughs> sort of like your brain gets altered for that particular phrase and, and, it, and it continues to sound like singing. For a very, very long time. All right, so here we have just one small indication that music is, well, it behaves very strangely. I mean, think about this. We started with some basic speech. 
repeated it a few times. Somewhere okay, so the cool thing about doing it that way is the energy comes from hearing the process of discovery. We don't describe it. We let you, let you hear the discovery itself. And ideas, we think, are very explorable in news format, whether they be long or short, or we do both, if you play with the ideas and struggle with them and argue about them. I don't have time to let you hear some of the arguments we get into, but uh, it just also gives you a chance to experiment wildly with format, with how you do the explaining. Um, so one time, we got interested in the autonomic nervous system. This is the system that kicks in when something shocking happens, and you have to have an immediate reaction. So it's fight or flight as an example. So when you fight, your muscles tense, your throat gets dry, your heartbeat goes up. You don't control that. It just happens. It happens fast. It's autonomic. But here's our story. We learned that the system works differently in men and women. And it's a really big difference. And in a moment, you'll find it a very familiar difference. Uh, the woman you're going to hear, um, we did a really odd thing to make the point. The woman you're going to hear is my actual real-life wife. And in the show, uh, we're in the middle of talking about the nervous system, talking to some professor or whatever, and all of a sudden, the phone rings. Here we go. Oh, crap. I forgot to turn the ring off. Hold on. Hello? Oh, hi. Mm. Yeah, hold on a second. Is your wife? Here. Hello? Robert? Yeah. I can't believe you're still there. What are you doing there? What do you mean, what am what, I doing here? You were supposed to be home an hour ago. Tamar, this Tamar, you, are you in the studio? We're on the I air. I don't care. What do you mean you don't you care? You were supposed to be home an hour ago. Uh, I reminded you this morning. I reminded you last night. I, I it's was... It's just not important to you. There's not such a big deal. I'll be back in... Actually, oh, this so is a perfect example. Been talking about. No. Robert's having a fight with his wife, Tamar, and while he's fighting, inside his body, his stomach is clenching, his heart is palpitating, hers is doing the same. Their brains are picking up these signals and thinking, anger, feel angry. So I'm working with other people My here. There are other people who are just as important as your work, and you've now screwed it up. How did I screw it up? How did I screw this up your work? Your now, at a certain point, Robert will probably realize he has screwed up, and... Just get home. He'll apologize. Okay, if I get home in 20 minutes, well, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I know this is horrible. Robert, is everything okay? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just a second. I'm really sorry. Okay. Maybe like now, when it comes to brains and bodies and men and women, the interesting thing is that when a man and woman fight, these systems in their body, the heart palpitating, the stomach clenching, while these systems do turn on at the same speed. And it takes like two seconds. According to Robert Spolsky. Where there's an interesting gender difference is how long it takes to turn off the system. And ladies, sorry in advance. And in general, it turns off more slowly in women than in men. Which may explain something that happens to couples all the time. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm really okay, sorry. This just isn't right. I know. Oh, I'm really sorry. And like, here we are. I, maybe, like, maybe at later we'll go okay. do something. Or I'm really sorry. Robert's stomach is relaxing. This is really stupid, I know. His heart is slowing. Very stupid. He thinks the fight might be over. Okay. But, you know... This is something you do all the time. Remember when we were having a dinner right after we got engaged and we went to the restaurant and I was waiting for you and I made the reservation and you, Tim, I was, that was in the Carter I was sitting administration. there for like 45 minutes. You didn't even call. I just you apologized. Didn't I... Did you hear what just happened there? It's this William James stuff coming back to haunt us a century later. Sapolsky says that sometimes the body actually tricks the brain. Tamar knows the fight is over mentally, but her body is still tense. Her heart is still racing and her brain thinks, wait. If my heart is still racing and I consciously know that this issue has been resolved, it must be because I'm still pissed off about that thing that happened in the Carter administration. You minimize everything everybody does for you. The brain fills a vacuum. What, do you have a list? you have a list there or something? I do. I have a long list. Like, do you know how you... often you do this sort of thing? I, heard, I do it like once. No, I, I can count them. As soon as the babies are called, I'm going to be out of town and says, should I make dinner for Robert? Because, of course, you can't make dinner for yourself and the kids. No. I, I do make dinner. I have made much of anything. baked potatoes last week, Wednesday. I made the baked potatoes. That's just applying heat. <laughs> <clears throat> now, when you hear a story like this, you realize, oh, my God, this has been happening to me since forever. I just didn't know it was science, you see. <laughs> And that's what we do. We like to start with what you know, work backwards, and add layers of abstraction as we go. And the surprise is this kind of stuff finds an audience, and it's a big audience, and allows me to say in a kind of prideful way, 
Check it out, Peter Jennings. May he rest in peace. Because to, to be fair, he was a wonderful, brilliant anchor. But there is more room now to explore new ways to talk about complex subjects, to do it at greater lengths, to go deeper, to get more subtle, because people are ready. The times, something's changed. You know, something's happened. iPods happened. Portability happened. Wearable computers happened. Now when people take long car trips or go to the Stairmaster, or go for runs, or spend hours cooking or lying in a hammock, they take us with them, and it turns out they're happy to fill these little down times, they're in between times, listening to a slightly confused reporter getting yelled at by his wife. And life, I must tell you, is full of very happy surprises. And one of them is this business of telling stories is entering a whole new, and I kind of think, a glorious phase. So thanks very much.